First, I'd like to thank the conference chair and the organisers for inviting me to address you today. I'm going to talk about the importance of the human microbiome in chronic disease prevention. Well, what microbiome are we talking about? Are we talking about the microbiome involving the GI tract, the microbiome we read so much about? No, we're talking about the entire human microbiome the microbes which exist in all our tissues, in our blood, that traffic in our blood inside the cells. Those are the microbes which can change, uh, change the way that genes are transcribed within cells and lead to chronic disease. This uh, is a wonderful drawing from The Economist and you can see the bottom left there that uh, human head and shoulders has been approximated by uh, microbial looking components. I find that a fascinating image and one for us to keep in mind. So where do these microbes come from? Well, we're born with a microbiome. We're born with not just microbes in our guts, but also microbes throughout the rest of our body. Uh, Dave Relman's group at Stanford has done wonderful work on this, and I've uh, given you a paper there to, to look up if you're interested in following it further. And then our mother gives us more microbes, beneficial microbes, we believe, or mostly beneficial microbes. And uh, we have plotted the microbes here on this XY uh, um, plot. This is from um, Raul Cabrero Rubio's paper. Um, and what it shows is that the microbes in human breast milk are actually different from the microbes in the GI tract, in the skin, in the feces, in the gut mucosa. They're different microbes. Uh, and uh, this plot uh, separates out the 16S RNA um, in, so that we can see that, that they are in fact different microbes quite easily. And what's even more interesting is that if vaginal delivery is used um, in birth, then the milk uh, appears at the bottom right there. The microbial components are separate and discrete in the uh, microbial space. But if C-section delivery is used, then a totally different set of microbes are produced in mother's breast milk. And uh, you can see them there in the top uh, middle of the, um, uh, of the drawing or of the plot. Um, so, so the microbes in a mother's milk are very important and there does seem to be a big difference depending on the way the human metabolism is working. So how does our microbiome grow from that point? Well, obviously we get microbes from our pets and from our foods and medicines. Professor Schoenfeld has already given a wonderful presentation on uh, Asia and how adjuvants uh, affect our immune system and our immune response. But also the vaccines themselves can be a problem sometimes. There was a study recently showing that BCG vaccine had many live organisms, organisms in it l form organisms that were quite capable of uh, infecting phagocytic cells. And then we get it from the air we breathe. This is a study done by Craig Venter, and he measured in an indoor hospital in San Diego and an indoor house in San Diego. He measured the uh, DNA RNA in the air from uh, insects, rodents, viruses, bacteria. And he found about 86% of the DNA in the air was from bacteria. Only about 8% um, of it was human in a hospital. In a house, it's almost the same. It's not surprising you'd have a lot of bacteria in a hospital, but in a house, in a house, it's also 85%. And indeed, a study was done recently showing that we carry around an aura of our microbiome with us, that if we check into a hotel room within 24 hours, we have changed the microbiome in the air and on the surfaces in that hotel room. The, the, I would argue one of the biggest contributors is the family. And you've all seen familial aggregation. Uh, amongst your patients, I'm sure, but the family and accreting microbes uh, to and from the rest of the family is a major factor. This uh, particular image is from Discover magazine, and you can look that up or, or look up the underlying paper. 
and there's nothing new in science. Uh, Rodin, um, several centuries ago, um, knew all about bacteria transfer between family members. So, how do these microbes cause disease? Well, to, to answer that, we have to understand a little bit about the complexity of chronic disease. And to do that, we, study, we can study the changes. And we study the changes by studying the changes in proteins, what we call the proteome, the human proteome, the, the way that our genes produce proteins, over 100,000 of them in, in the human body from the human genome, and how those proteins then interact in the interactome. Two more ohms, sorry about that. Uh, but over 100,000 uh, proteins in the human uh, proteome and in semi-infinite number of uh, interactions in the interactome, which is gradually being built up. This is a study which was done of multiple sclerosis patients, other neurodegenerative disease patients, and uh, normal controls. And what is plotted there are the number of proteins that are common and discrete in each of those groups that were, that were drawn from the CSF, from the cerebrospinal fluid, about three and a half thousand were drawn. And in other neurodegenerative diseases, there were about 1,482 that were unique. In multiple sclerosis, 1,337. And in normal patients, 633 were unique you can see that we're not just talking about one pathway. We're not just talking about the JAK-STAT pathway. We're talking about lots and lots of pathways. Chronic disease has got incredibly complex mechanisms which build up over time. And you can see it in these studies of the proteome. And here is another uh, proteome study of chronic fatigue syndrome versus post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome and normals. Once again, you see large variation between the two diagnoses of chronic fatigue syndrome and post-treatment Lyme syndrome, 738 unique in CFS and uh, 2768, uh, sorry, uh, 692 in, in Lyme and about 724 in normals. Huge number of changes within the CSF. So how can the microbes do this? How can the microbe cause the human body to transcribe genes incorrectly or those genes to fold incorrectly? There are a number of mechanisms. Uh, Emil Rosco did a wonderful study back in the 1980s at Columbia where he used electron microscopy to look at monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils uh, from the uh, eye, the vitreous of the eye of patients sarcoidosis patients, Crohn's disease, and uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients, and found that in every case, all those phagocytic types were parasitized by microbes. This particular image shows a monocyte from the vitreous of the eye of a sarcoidosis patient showing hundreds of tiny coccoids uh, in colonies which, have, colonies which have parasitized the cells. So the, the phagocytes which are supposed to kill the microbes are actually being overcome by the microbes, which then manage to persist. And a more recent study using a modern fluorescent technique showed exactly the same thing with E. coli. Uh, e. coli overcomes um, the uh, macrophages in this case, just macrophages. Uh, e. coli overcomes the ability of macrophages to resist um, the engulfment and they then persist within the macrophages over time. A wonderful study from Isabel Gordo's group in, in Portugal. And you can see the bright spots within the macrophages, which are the engulfed but not killed E. coli. In fact, there are a number of microbes that we know persist inside macrophages. EBV is the perhaps the best known. Um, EBV downregulates a number of the uh, nuclear receptors, but one that we were focused on was the VDR, the vitamin D receptor. Not because of vitamin D. Vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's a steroid activator. But aside from that, the VDR is key to the proper operation of the innate immune system in the human body. 
and other species which we uh, saw new uh, acting on the BDR were all of the nasties that are so well documented in chronic disease. MTB, Aspergillus, Borrelia, Chlamydia, uh, HCV, cytomegalovirus and EBV. So we worked on the assumption that uh, the VDR and innate immune defences were the key to chronic disease. Because in order to survive within those phagocytic cells, the uh, microbes have to knock out the VDR pathway because the VDR pathway is responsible for generating cathelicidin and a number of other antimicrobials, endogenous antimicrobials. And the VDR is unique to man. There is no animal that has a VDR that functions similarly to man. So I went looking for a drug that had activity in the VDR that was an approved drug, a safe drug, that would activate the VDR. And I found one, surprisingly. Uh, a drug called Omasartan, which uh, has a primary target of the anti-2 receptor, uh, anti tension 2 type 1 receptor, uh, also has activity inside the VDR and turns it back on again. It hits about half a dozen receptors, as most drugs do, uh, multiple targets. And when we change the dosing from uh, the dosing, you can see the green curve there in the middle at the bottom on the pharmacokinetic uh, graph. When we change the dosing from once a day to every, six, every four to six hours, you can see that a concentration builds up in the bloodstream, and that concentration allows it to target the nuclear receptors. So what happens is we allow uh, omosartan to uh, get into the body, uh, activate the VDR in, in a dosing that allows it to activate the VDR. And the VDR can then transcribe the genes that are being blocked by the microbes to ensure their persistent, persistence. The normal way of VDR is activated is by the steroid calcitriol, which is generated within each cell. Um, but the microbes block that. For example, Aspergillus produces a toxin called gliotoxin that stops the calcitriol from uh, activating the VDR. Microbes all have different ways of doing it. But the bottom line is the VDR is knocked out. It's very low in chronic disease. You can see that in your, in your patients. Um, and uh, by reactivating it, we showed that we were able to uh, change the outcome in a whole... Uh, slew of chronic diseases. Uh, this chart was reported at Porto and it shows from rheumatoid arthritis to diabetes insipidus, uh, all responding at a rate of about 80, 81% after 36 months. On a monotherapy, just Olmosartan, no other drugs, 2,5-D held at a low figure and the therapy was not personalised. But there is a problem. As you start killing the microbes, or as the immune system starts killing the microbes, some of those immune components start doing harm to the body as well. It's called immunopathology. And the immunopathology during healing is a major problem with chronic disease. We're talking about a patient enduring maybe five years of uh, increase in symptoms, uh, a manageable increase in symptoms, but nevertheless an increase in symptoms from immunopathology while their body heals. The other thing I want to point out is that the immunopathology causes an increase in markers as well. Um, when you dose olmosartan in this way, in this case this is the ANA titer from a rheumatoid arthritis patient, and it doubled uh, following commencement of therapy and then dropped back over the first 800 days and has been zero uh, ever since then, over 10 years now. Um, but once the autoantibodies had disappeared, that, or the autoantibody titer had disappeared, that didn't stop the disease symptoms. The patient still took a number of years to get clear of the disease. So in summary... The human microbiome causes changes to the interactome inside the phagocytic cells, causing dysfunctions in cell metabolism, which we know is chronic disease. The relevance to PPPM is that by preventing the intracellular microbiome from overcoming the host innate immunity, we can prevent the disease and or reduce the disease severity. 
we need to keep innate immunity strong throughout life. And I'm going to speak next month in uh, St. Petersburg on that topic. In fact, how uh, electromagnetic radiation weakens the immune system. So those are my colleagues that will be at that conference. I look forward to seeing you. And once again, thanks to the conference chair and organisers for inviting me to address you here. Thank you.